great to be here. It is my incredibly great pleasure to introduce the host for this evening, the ever-loving, incredibly charming, science communicator extraordinaire, <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson! <laughs> Eugene Merman. Neil. Um, let's. So, bring out just to be clear, these Star Talk Lives were birthed in the Eugene Merman Comedy Festival. There's a whole comedy festival named after this guy. And since Star Talk has always had a professional comedian as my co-host, he figured that would fit nicely into that format. Yeah. And so we're here as a continuation of that series. Yeah. Yes, and let me bring out two comedians. The first one, a uh, very funny man. He is the author of How to Be Black. And he was a supervising producer on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Ladies and gen gentlemen, Baratunde Thurston. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be the coolest first name of Baratunde. That's yeah. got to be the coolest name. That's a like, pretty cool ever. name. Okay. I, might, I might take it. <laughs> um, and, uh, the, uh, next guest, a very funny woman. She is the host of NPR's Ask Me Another. Ladies and gentlemen, Ophira Eisenberg. <laughs> I don't know if we pre-advertise what the title of this evening is. The title of this evening is, Let's Make America Smart Again. <laughs> so, we comb the land for people who could give us insight into this. And one such person is Dr. Professor John Holdren, the former science advisor to President Obama. John Holdren, come on out. <laughs> at the moment, he's professor of environmental policy up at Harvard, and he came down just for this. So thank, thanks, John. Thank you. Also, from the Obama administration, we have a biologist, Joe Handelsman. Joe, come on out. She was associate director for science at the Office of Science and Technology Policy under President Obama. And now she's a microbiologist at the University of Wisconsin. Is that right? Cheeseheads, yes, yes. So, uh, this event will be in three parts. Initially, we'll talk about Earth and keeping track of what's going on and why. Talk about the science and the policy related to that. Next, we will talk about biology and all of how that affects health and get inside the National Institutes of Health and what they're all about and why. And we'll end up with a final segment on the future. The future of space, the future of AI, robotics, and so we're gonna do it all. All the science that matters in this country, and we're doing it now. This is a live broadcast here at the Count Basie Theater, Red Bank, New Jersey, Star Talk. Let's do this. All right. Well, Earth Day is in April. Earth Day, April 22nd, and it coincides with the Science March on Washington. So, yeah. so John, uh, Earth Day began in 1970. Right. Why, why not 1960? Surely people cared about Earth in 1960. <laughs> no, people did, but what had happened during the course of the 60s is there were the whole series of environmental disasters that got people's <laughs> attention. <laughs> so, so we need disaster yes. to protect, so we don't know how to protect something proactively. 
Disaster's help. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What were like the three best disasters? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Cayuga River catching fire. Oh. Was uh, was uh, one. That'll, that'll do. That'll uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lake Erie becoming totally clogged with algae, so that most of the fish were dying, was uh, was a second one. Sounds worse. In that period, yeah. and of course, the air pollution in the Los Angeles basin getting worse and worse, so that on most days you couldn't see the mountains. In fact, I was at Caltech in the early 1970s. I had been there yeah. in Pasadena. I had been there for six months before I knew there were mountains right behind <laughs> Caltech. <laughs> Okay, and so Joe, you were you worked with John Holdren in yes. the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Like, what is what is OSTP? I think most people have never heard of it. So why? What's wrong? What, what do you not do? <laughs> well, we obviously didn't advertise ourselves very much. <laughs> Our job was to mix policy and science, and that meant two things. Some of it was policy for science, how to make our science enterprise as strong as it could be. Uh, using policy to shape it. But the other side was using science to shape policy on issues that weren't obviously about science. For, like what? Like forensics. Forensic science oh, mm -hmm. is supposedly based on science, but in fact there's not that much science behind it. And so we brought the science to bear on that issue. And, uh, and so John, you're you were appointed by Obama, is that yes. correct? Did you have to be approved by the Senate? Yes, but there are two different jobs involved. Science advisor to the president is not subject to Senate confirmation. Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy is subject to Did confirmation. Did you have both titles? And I had both titles, but I could start serving as the president's science advisor on inauguration day 2009. Took two months to get confirmed as director of OSTP, and in those two months, I couldn't sit in the director's office, couldn't give any orders to anybody in OSTP, but I could talk to the president. Wow. So, so glad so, this bureaucracy is going to be yeah. gone now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how was Obama among the presidents with regard to science, would you say? Well, I think President Obama was the most science-savvy president since Thomas Jefferson. Tom <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, of course, was his own science advisor. Yeah, yeah, he was badass. Uh, and, uh, yeah. But, but I, uh, I but, hope Warren Harding never hears you say this. <laughs> <laughs> but the president came into office understanding how and why science and technology matter for the economy, for public health, for the environment, for national security. So he, he just got it. He, he was preloaded. Pre he just got it. Okay. He understood it. All right, so uh, Earth Day, I, I, I still, forgive me, don't really know what you're supposed to do on Earth Day. Like, what are you supposed to do? I, I think you're supposed to draw a picture <laughs> of the Earth yeah. and then get it on a tote bag uh, yeah, and walk and, and around. Walk around with it. Walk yeah. on the Earth. Appreciate <laughs> it. Walk on the Earth. Yeah, touch the Earth. You know, that'd be a good thing on Earth Day. Eat a stick of pot butter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very common. <laughs> Look at a baby for as long as it'll let you. <laughs> now, now, on a more serious note. Earth Day has, has, has a, a biological motive, doesn't it? Absolutely. Some of us think it should be renamed Soil Day because it's about the Earth, but the most important thing on the Earth is the soil. That's where all of our food comes from. And wait, wait, don't you study soil? I do. Okay. A little so, when you say some of us, like, that's very how many, specific. <laughs> how many want to call it soil day? Yeah. Um, a few of us. <laughs> see, see, I would say like water was pretty important. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, but See, but I, can soil. Go, I can go more than a week without soil. <laughs> Keep telling but yourself I'm dead that. dead in 10 days without water. But the earth is dead really fast without soil. So you can't use yourself as the standard, sorry. But, know, right? but it's okay, I mean. And Neil, we, you we can't can... go for a week without air. Air, yeah. air is really important. True. Yeah, that's minutes without <laughs> yeah, air. Right. Yeah. So, so, so when I think of uh, Earth Day 1970, in that same year, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, was founded, and so was NOAA, the National Oceanic an atmospheric administration. So these are, so NOAA fans. That, that was a benchmark year for people caring. So what's, I'm trying to understand. 
Well, on a slightly more serious note, one of the things more you're supposed to do... More serious than caring about the earth? No, one of the... <laughs> <laughs> no, more serious than you're going for a week without soil. Oh, right, okay. The, on a more serious note, what it's really about, I think, is talking with folks and reminding them about all the ways we depend on air and soil and water and sunlight. And, you know, the trouble is most people today, too many people, think that food materializes de novo on supermarket shelves. You know, they think that when you plug something into the wall, the electricity is coming from right behind the wall. Yeah, they don't yeah. understand there has I think to be a whole system yeah. connected yeah. to it. Yeah. And yeah. they think that most pest control is done by pesticides. They think that most availability of water is through canals and dams. They just don't get it that we depend on the earth for our well-being. And that's you, what it's really about. You guys worked in an office that should be household conversation. And it's not, how come? Well, I think partly because we backed up the president. The president was the face of OSTP in many ways because he rolled out the policy, he represented it. I remember, how, when was it? When C. Everett Koop mm -hmm. uh, told people how to not, or how to use condoms or whatever, I forgot the details, as, as what was his title again? Um, <laughs> well, no, I forgot, I remember something about I sex. Like something <laughs> about sex, okay? I believe he told people to masturbate and then the president had to take it back. No, yeah, <laughs> right. No, no, no. Totally wrong. No, no, was that, was next, yeah. Yeah, that was the next. HHS. Yeah, that was the next. Those medals are all right. Jocelyn Elders. Yeah, well, that's right. Jocelyn Elders, yeah. Yeah, oh. uh, Jocelyn Elders. I remember well, the masturbation lessons. Do? Yeah. Why do I even know his name then? Well, I, I, so he was around, I think, in the, in the AIDS era where, so, so we all knew his name. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, so why didn't we know your name? Because you were out of it. <laughs> you, you must have been out of it. Everybody I know knows John Holdren's name. You work with the guy. <laughs> well, but I know a few people who are outside the White House, and they all think that he's a hero. Well, so here's the thing. Earth Day. Okay. So, Earth Day, there was somehow in the air, no pun intended, a, a sense of concern for Earth as a planet that came out. Of, and that was like right in the middle of when we were going to the moon. Right? Mm -hmm. I think we went to explore the moon, we looked back and discovered Earth for the first time. And in that discovery, Earth became a focus of our, uh, of our concern and of our, uh, uh, we wanted to preserve this spaceship floating there in, in, in the void. We basically took a planet-sized selfie. Yeah, basically, that's right, from a quarter million miles away. So it looks like we, we exploited that fact legislatively. Absolutely, that, that blue marble photo, that selfie mm -hmm. that Baratunde has just referred to was critical. And so EPA gets formed, apparently not under any controversy, right, I guess? Well, you know, but, it was interesting that, uh, you know, President Nixon actually thought it was important to do that. And I think he was Republican, last I remembered. It's true. It was one of his better moments. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think today he'd be considered a communist. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, uh, the mission of the EPA, to ensure that all Americans are protected from risks to human health and to the environment, from where they live, where they learn, and where they work. So, um, so this sounds like an important organization. Very important organization, and one which has been built up since its inception, and which has done, on the whole, a pretty good job. And what's the relationship between NOAA and the EPA? Well, NOAA is basically an environmental monitoring and a science organization. They're responsible for understanding what's happening in the oceans, what's happening in the atmosphere. The National Weather Service is part of NOAA, for example. So okay. our weather forecasts come from NOAA. And by the way, a member of Congress once famously said, I don't know why we have to fund NOAA, we have the Weather Channel. Yeah, and that's, okay. <laughs> yeah. and that's what's called unclear on the concept. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, all right, so both organizations exist today, and what, can you comment on their support in Congress? Well, it's mixed, obviously. Uh, NOAA and EPA uh, have had strong support through both Republican and Democratic administrations uh -huh. over the years, right. but now uh, they are faced with severe budget cuts, most severe in EPA, if 
uh, President Trump's budget is accepted by Congress, and that's not a foregone conclusion. He's proposed a budget for EPA, but Congress has to approve it. But that budget cuts EPA's total funding by over 30 percent, and the research and development organization in EPA is cut by 50 percent in that proposed budget. NOAA's budget is also being cut, particularly in respect to ocean monitoring and research okay, and but, climate data. Now, you don't have so, anything to do with that because you're not in Washington anymore. That's right. <laughs> so why am I even asking you this question? <laughs> well, a lot of people are asking me what is going to be the role of science and technology in the new administration going I'm forward. not going to ask you that. I want no. to ask that of a politician. <laughs> Is there a politician in the house? <laughs> <laughs> he looks like one. He doesn't. <laughs> what? Oh! <laughs> Hello, Red Bank. <laughs> Senator Cory Booker, New Jersey. So you can't come up in my house, Jersey, and, and not, not say hello, man. I got word that you were in Jersey. You did get word. You crossed from the dark side of the Hudson. I crossed the moat. Into the light. I crossed the moat of the Hudson River. Welcome to New Jersey. It's great to have you Thank here. you. Dr. Delighted to be in your, yes. your home state. <laughs> Senator Brooker, you're a former mayor of Newark. Yes. That, that, that can't have been easy. Uh, it was the best, hardest seat of my life. There you go. And so you are sitting senator in midterm right now, correct? Thank you, New Jersey. Yes, okay. <laughs> so so we, we have people who previously served, and you were in Congress while they were serving. First of all, um, their names might not be publicly known, but they're heroic people that made Obama probably one of the greatest science presidents we've ever had, because they're the people he had around. The people Thank because you. of the folks he put in place. Yeah. Yes. And so, so we're now talking about a president's budget, because a lot of this, I think, is just a mystery to so many people. It was certainly a mystery to me. So the president puts out a budget, and doesn't the Congress kind of have to go along with most of what that is? Not at all. Not at all. If you read the Article I branch of the Constitution, the first branch of government described as the Congress, they have extraordinary powers. They set the budget. So the president suggests or presents something to uh, Congress, but Congress actually makes the decisions. That is like a constitutional smackdown. That was so politely uh, delivered. <laughs> <laughs> like Article One, son. <laughs> that suggests actually. <laughs> yes. That, by the way, that we could do Hamilton too. Article One, son. We almost had a like you know freestyling right, right now. Right. We're on the backstage. Yes. Right. So you sell. So you and your fellow ninety-nine other senators actually wield real power on that budget. Extraordinary power. Extraordinary power. Good. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to hear so, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy. More. Let's hear I mean, more I was, how I you was have power. <laughs> you know, I was aghast at the, at the president's budget. I think it was one of the most scary documents that basically he put forth in one document a reflection of what his values are, which frankly, if you look at his budget, the so-called skinny budget, and the way he tears apart critical programs that affect every element of Americans' lives, yeah. even the base of the people that voted for him, it was, it was a patent betrayal of those people who supported him. And would in terms of creating jobs and economic strength is what he preached in his, uh, uh, his campaigning days, uh, it would have really debilitated this nation's ability to compete globally in a world that now is a knowledge-based economy, which means science and innovation and technology is so critical. So to take away the government's role in that would really be putting both hands behind our back as we're competing with the Chinese and the German and the Japanese who are making significant investments, in fact, beginning to outstrip America when it comes to investing in R&D. So what is, what is the, uh, I want to compare sort of what were some of the successes for under EPA and NOAA in Obama that might be at risk right now? Well, I, I just want to let people know, I mean, everything we touch represents your public dollars. I mean, everything here from the batteries to the touch screen to the GPS, the origin of the, all of this science and technology that the private sector is now using to create thousands of jobs is, is public sector investments in science technology. And, and hardly anybody knows that. Hardly anybody knows that. A dollar invested, in fact, 
all of us probably are fiscal conservatives. I had to be when I was the mayor of Newark. Every taxpayer dollar was precious. The reality is, is the best return on investment for a taxpayer dollar, one of the best ones you could get in government investments is in things like the National Institute of Health, uh, is, is such things in investing in science. You get almost more than double the return in terms of long-term economic growth for our economy. And so to savage those programs, to cut the So EPA, there are people who don't recognize that the government is actually a good place where some kinds of money gets spent, rather than saying the government should have no money at all. Yeah, well, let's take a step back and just look at the EPA. I mean, we, I believe in the principles of a free market, but Newark, for example, their environment is a testimony to the free market run amok. In other words, the river, Passaic River is toxic, the soil in Newark is full of lead, uh, the, the, the uh, oxygen, we have terrible asthma rates, and those are caused by companies that weren't properly regulated pouring toxins into the world and destroying not just the health of in the environment, but also the fiscal competitiveness of a city in the long term. So by the EPA being savage like it is, not just the research and development side, but just holding people accountable for the laws that they're breaking out there and hurting the environment, actually it costs all of us money. So this is a message that needs to get out there, okay? So you're a senator with, who's elected to office and you don't have a formal science background. So who's gonna listen? Oh, oh, oh. I have a degree in political science. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you got me there. Okay. Thank you very no. much. That's <laughs> so, adorable. So, so you have it. So there are advisors. There's the National Academy of Sciences, Office of Science and Technology Policy. So you, we would like to think that when they speak, the public listens and heeds. But somehow that's not happening. And I don't think any of us understand why. So what's up with that? <laughs> well, I, I think that it is really important now more than ever, and I think a lot of folks learned this with this last election, that the only thing necessary for evil to be triumphant is for good people to do nothing. Or and to do like fact, some, but not enough. The, the, the fact, yeah. um, right, we've learned that retweeting is just not gonna cut it. <laughs> No. Depends on the tweet, though. Some of those tweets are hot. Yeah. And, and, and so as, as the age-old wisdom, which I just cited, the reality is, is we did not have a, a, an activist citizenry. And, and a lot of folks, and you were, so we were joking before about this concept of love, but patriotism, by definition, is love of country. Love is not a beaten word. It demands action and sacrifice. And so if you love your country, you've got to stay engaged on these issues, you've got to stay uh, involved, and you've got to let your, your elected officials know that, hey, you're going to be overseeing a budget. In fact, the budget of this country runs out on April 28th, and the budget decisions are going to be made probably on a continuing resolution. What are you going to prioritize? If you're not speaking up and letting your voice be heard and engaging in the process, uh, then you're basically surrendering uh, precious space like the what we're just talking about. So let me, let me just uh, anchor this in, in data. So in order to make an informed decision, make informed protest even, uh, you need data. And NOAA is responsible for many, many satellites in orbit around the Earth monitoring climate, for example. And you would think that this would be sufficient so that people will then hear about the data, learn about the data, and act upon the data as citizen scientists, if you will. So what, where is the disconnect here? Well, for, first of all, the public actually understands climate change better than many members of the Congress do. The, the, he just, and he's right. Got a lot of snaps yeah, he's right. A lot of snaps today. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry Corey. President <laughs> Company, et cetera. But plus, he's, he's no longer working in the government now, so he can say that. Okay. <laughs> no, but it's true. That's what polls show. You know, polls show, uh, and I said this to President Obama at one point, polls show that in the range of two-thirds of Americans believe that climate change is real, substantially caused by humans, already doing harm. We need to do something about it. Two-thirds. By the way, only 50% believe evolution is a fact. Mm. Uh, mm. And uh, when I told the president that, and I said this was, he was saying, you scientists have to do a better job educating the public. And I said, well, we've done pretty well on climate change and it's more than evolution. He said, that's no consolation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not 100%. So people, uh, they seem to be sort of in sort of denial of data that they don't like. 
Well, I, I, it's almost like they're afraid of what the data is going to say. I mean, we have laws in Congress that were shocking to me that I found out where we're blocking even studying things. Like, we're, we're blocking even the studying of gun violence and understanding the effects of it. And, and so... We have supporters of blocking gun violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so... And so the question is why? And I, I want to I be very blunt with some of the things that we have to understand. There are large moneyed interests, large corporate interests in this country that are very invested into the status quo right now. And on elections, they spend billions and billions of dollars supporting people who will to protect fossil fuel industries and others, protect the status quo. So you can't expect, it, with that much money being poured into the system, that the people that often get elected as a result of that won't be protecting that despite the evidence and try to do everything they can to fight the evidence. It's like the tobacco industry for so long. They would fund scientists who would come up with funky science that was wrong and try to debunk or at least confuse people as to what the data was showing about cigarette smoke. So, so Joe, if you, you like, for a while worked in infectious diseases, is that right? Or you, you, you were part of the programs that taught people about it? Yeah, in OSTP, we dealt with it, several epidemics like Ebola and Zika virus, and we handled it. John and I were, were the key people in OSTP who handled so, it. So that's a case where if something goes wrong, people get sick and die. Right. So there's immediate cause and effect. Yep. And climate change has a little bit more of a horizon, but if sea levels rise and you start flooding, it seems to me that's cause and effect. Well, and heat waves and droughts and wildfires burning larger and larger areas. You know, in the Arctic. Can't this now, weigh more than the billions of dollars what, of advertising? I think we might be looking at this the wrong way. First of all, funky science sounds amazing. I don't know why you're dissing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to a funky science party. You yeah. Second, we, John, you started by talking about, you, like the EPA and NOAA were born out of rivers on fire. Maybe they're trying to return to that level of disaster and urgency to inspire us. So well, I know what's happening. I mean, the, we're, we're, anyone, oh, the, the reason so many Americans now believe that climate change is real and dangerous is they're experiencing it in their lives. They're seeing it on their TV sets. They're seeing it on their iPads. And it's stunning. If you look at the expansion of the areas afflicted by extreme heat every summer, if you look at the areas burned by wildfires, for the first time in modern times, the tundra is burning in the Arctic. The tundra is burning. That never happened before. That the Arctic, sounds course, terrible. Is, yeah. <laughs> it, ne it never happened before in the period when we were looking. Right. right. Okay. I, the tundra. I, I went to a doctor for a sinus cold, and she told me it was global warming. I swear to you. She said it was global warming. She sounds like a coup. I did report her. You could see uh, every coup. But New, yeah. Jersey, New Jerseyans are seeing um, the, the financial impact of climate change right now. So we have, most people don't understand we have a massive fishing industry in New Jersey. What's happening with the acidification of our oceans, the warming of the oceans, they're seeing fish that they used to be able to find off the coast of New Jersey are now being found further up in Connecticut. Uh, and uh, Maine. Uh, Maine in so Maine. that's kind of nice for New England. And, and, uh, <laughs> Sorry, well, New England New Jersey. Is, New England, <laughs> but New England is complaining because they're seeing lobsters and other things moving further and further. That is Canada. a problem. And, and, and so, but more than that, we are a state that lives in flood areas. And now right. the flood map literally are, now you're seeing what were used to be 100-year floods happening with more frequency, which is costing New Jerseyans a lot more money. Okay, so I like what you were saying, that, who, 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 who said it, that maybe we are, re, we are returning to the pre-1970 state of, of circumstances where we've, we've got to drop low mm -hmm. before we recover as one. They're trying to inspire us, man. I think you just Oh, the negative. disasters are trying to inspire us. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting way to think about it, yeah. It's the only way to stay sane. <laughs> so, so do you think maybe it would help to just light a few local rivers on fire? <laughs> <laughs> like, <I'm saying. laughs> do we need to light rivers that like Trump would come across? <laughs> like on his walks? Like Mar-a-Lago. Like, like, oh like Mar-a-Lago on fire. <laughs> Fifth river at my golf course is on fire. So, Joe, is it, is it too late? No, I don't think it's too late, and I think the... the well, because, because the river on fire, and the, that's all kind of local stuff. Right. And we talk about climate change, we're talking about planet-wide. Yeah. So that requires planet-wide cooperation and participation. 
-hmm. So is it, is it too late? Well, there was one study that showed that people believe in climate change uh, based more on the three previous days of weather than anything else. Wow. And so their, their belief idiots. goes up and down. <laughs> so, so are we just like three really warm Aprils away from people being like, fine, let's fix this? <laughs> so I'm sorry to return to this point. The, the cynicism is killing me. We are a nation that, that the majority of us, the majority of Republicans, believe that climate change is real. The disconnect is not the people of this nation realizing that there's a problem. The disconnect is, you know, King used to always say, uh, and one of the more, more eloquent than I could ever say, the problem today, what we'll have to repent wait, for wait, who is said this again? Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King. It, it, what we'll have to repent for is not the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, it's the appalling silence and inaction of the good people. And so that, that's the problem, is that it's not that, you poll Republicans, the majority of them, as you said, believe climate change is real. Millennial Republicans are so far progressive on, more progressive right. on these issues. And on everything. And on everything. All issues. And by the way, the only major political party on the planet Earth, every other nation, their right party and their left party believe in climate change. The official elected Republican leadership is the only one on the planet Earth that does not officially believe in climate change. That's called so American exceptionalism. So should we put that leadership on a different planet? I, yeah. I think what we need is... <laughs> there you go, Neil. Let me give you an example. This is, this is simple. You know, I, I'm always a big believer that the power of the people is greater than the people in power. But folks don't exercise that power. As Alice Walker said, the most common way people give up their power is not realizing they have it in the first place. And so the cynicism that gets thrown around is actually a toxic state of being because it's surrendering your ability to make change because things can't be changed. We, what we, this is something very simple. If just millennials alone, Barack Obama said this in a speech to Howard students, forget Republican or Democrat, if just millennial generation, the biggest population bubble coming up demographically right now, if they just voted at the same levels that ex geners did, 40, 50% in midterm elections, the entire Congress would change. And, and so this is not, Obama said, this is not complicated. He looked at the young people and said, you don't need to occupy anything, just vote. And, and, and so, and so that, that, this is not a problem of knowing what is right to do. And I fear. Wait, okay. How do we get that message onto Snapchat? <laughs> wait, wait. So, so I, I get this. I get that. And remembering that in the 60s, huge protests all the time in every major city, campus unrest. It was a time where citizenry was trying to take back the government. And I get that. And you're getting some of that now. But at the end of the day, it comes down to policy. That's what it comes down to, doesn't it? I mean, right. what policies are in place that we can all agree but to you, but, that solve these problems? But you can win fights. Like I came in and I actually took heat even back here in New Jersey for arguing. I said, okay, I need to figure out a deal to strike with Republicans. And I worked with uh, a lot of my colleagues on this and saying, hey, the problem is oil and gas industry get all kind of tax credits for, for innovation and stuff like that. But Renewable energy, which we are losing ground to the Chinese and the Germans in their innovation, their technology, the jobs of the future. We're losing ground because the tax credits for wind and solar are one year. They're not predictable tax credits that industry needs. And so we fought with an exchange. We allowed the export of oil, something we had bought then, in exchange for seven years of predictable tax credit. Well, as soon as Congress did that, what, what do you think has happened to the solar and wind industry in the United States? Boom. The investments are going up. The innovation is going up. So it's the art of compromise. It's the, we won that battle in Congress. It's not something that made the front pages of newspapers, but we're in there every day fighting. And the thing that we need from the public, because I've watched, this has only been 100 days of the Trump administration, but people don't realize it. the day Congress changed, the new Congress came in, one of the first things the Republicans tried to do in the House was to remove the watchdogs, the ethics watchdogs. And it was the public that so was outraged that they stopped them in their tracks and they reversed course. I've seen that a number of times since then, that the public and the press exposing what's happening has helped to move things back. And you and I both know history. When it comes to science, the ability for the right poets, the right inspiration to prick the moral consciousness and the urgency of people, whether it's Kennedy talking about going to the moon, which was fueled science uh, uh, like crazy, or just simple Americans well-known people that have powerful platforms like Neil deGrasse Tyson bringing, bringing science, 
help us Neil deGrasse Tyson. Bring science into the mainstream. <laughs> I mean, you are, you are a guy that's getting folk woke on science issues, and I think that that's really powerful. I don't know I was woke in folks. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, no, what I, I'm trying to do is, through forums such as this and everything else, is just try to not tell people what is true about the universe, but empower people to understand why. And in that way, they can take ownership of that knowledge without even having to reference me, right? If all it was was, this is true because Tyson said so, then I failed as an educator. You say, this is true because A goes to B, and this caused that, and that caused that, then you own that information, and that then gets shared, and I'm not even in that picture. I don't have to be at that point. And then everybody takes command of their lives and of the country in which we live. Mm-hmm. What a concept. It also, it also helps a lot of us not just wake up every day screaming, because uh, we know that there's someone out there that sounds sane. Okay, so, so uh, one point, um, Carl Sagan was once asked uh, about, uh, uh, Sagan, yeah? <laughs> I, I think they were celebrating that he was asking Did you catch question. that the senator earlier on said, billions and billions, did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he actually said that, I heard that. Um, he was asked, uh, with regard to superheroes, what was his favorite superhero? And he's not a fan of superheroes. Because superheroes, as they're portrayed, um, it gives us the excuse to not do anything about problems in the world. Because you're just waiting around for someone who has the power to solve it while you're eating popcorn watching movies. Mm-hmm. And so, so, so to, to the senator's point, quoting, was it Alice Walker, the biggest uh, it's the power you don't know you actually have right. that is the failure. Yes. I, I paraphrase, but. Yes. Uh, it's the most common way we give up our power is not realizing we have it in the first place. Not even knowing you had already ceded it to someone else who's using it. Yes. Possibly against you. Most likely, if you check out of a system, uh, that system is going to work against you. It's like when Time Magazine said that we were all person of the year. <laughs> Do you think Carl it Sagan, did say that? I remember yeah. that. Remember and, the mirror? Right. Biggest and, top and that was lame. That was like the was lamest the worst, person but, of the year ever. Right. Or was it the best? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's what's the generation where there are no losers and everyone is a winner? Right. Yeah. See, I think they had the editorial board in that moment. And yeah. 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 Do you think Carl Sagan secretly liked Green Lantern, though? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I'll check his people on, <laughs> yeah. on that. Yes. So coming, coming up in the next segment, we're going to explore and in fact celebrate the latest advances in medical research, genetics, and health. When Star Talk returns live from the Count Basie Theater, New Jersey. <laughs> the universe is the man. No, the universe is the gender-neutral human who we all love. <laughs> Red Bank, New Jersey, give it up for Star Talk! Woo! Can I, can I just point something out about Eugene? Do, do your thing. Eugene is one of the proud representatives of a great tradition in America. He is an immigrant uh, from, where are you from, sir? Would you? I forget. No, uh, <laughs> uh, Russia. You're from Russia. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so and, and, uh, I'm a U.S. citizen, so you can't get rid of me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. So he's a first-generation immigrant. He's a first-generation yeah. immigrant. You, yeah. you were born in another country. You came here. Yeah. And you're. I making... can't be president, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that subject, I will add because I just did this homework that. Uh, the average, decade by decade average of first generation immigrants in the United States since 1900 is about 10%. So it's one in 10 Americans were born somewhere else at any given time across the century. Now, let's ask another question. What percentage of American winners of the Nobel Prize in the sciences was a first generation immigrant? A third of all American Nobel Prizes in chemistry, physics, and human physiology were foreign born. So they're three times as represented in the science, this highest prize of science, than they are even in the population. Well, I'll give you an example of this. So people who come down and lobby in Washington, I love when people don't hire lobbyists, but they come down themselves. I see lots of New Jerseyans come down 
And when I see college professors from Princeton to my university of Stanford come, and they come to me and they say, look, this is crazy. We bring these folks in, the brightest minds to study at our universities on student visas. We use our resources, giving them the best education on the planet Earth. As soon as that student visa runs out, what is our country now saying to them? Get out of our nation. Right. And, and that's ridiculous uh, when we have a country that attracts this greatness and then sends it back out in, in the world. I, I would like to point out on, on that particular point that President Obama proposed in 2011 to staple a green card to every graduate degree in science earned by a foreign citizen. Just staple the right. green card to the degree. Well, and well, it hasn't happened. Is that illegal? Let me just tell you what's worse. They have, in, in, around Stanford, uh, I was told there's a billboard that says you can't get your H-1B visa, you know, stay, come to Canada. Um, and so other countries are seeing what we used to do to accelerate ahead of the rest of the planet Earth. Uh, and one of those things that we, they saw was they had policies that tried to attract the brightest of the, of sure. the globe. And they're saying, okay, if America's not gonna do that anymore, we wanna do that because we wanna lead. And just in all fairness, um, uh, Newt Gingrich said that as well, to staple a green card. What? Wow. Just, just so you know, I just wanna just be fair out there. And one of you his said few, a lot of One of his few sage observations. <laughs> I, I am Canadian, and all my Canadian uh, friends now treat me like I have a illness. <laughs> Is that yeah, illness the, being American? Yeah, they're like, how's it going? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. That's how so two people me. on the stage now are foreign born. Yeah, and I actually, I'm, I, I'm only on a green card. Um, I'm not Authorities, a can you? Yeah. Hey, no, no, I'm a new mom. I have an anchor baby. I'm cool. <laughs> anchor baby. <laughs> So let me ask you guys something. I've got science advisors here. I have a politician here. Well, clue us in how advice is obtained, received, and enacted or not. What is that dynamic here? Because I don't know. Well, f first of all, I had a great relationship with Democratic senators. Uh, uh, but not Republican yeah. senators. A few Republican senators. Okay. Ma many, many fewer. But, I mean, p part of the way it works is there's a lot of interaction between the scientists and government and the Congress. We t the scientists and government testify all the time. In front of the Senate. Committees. Or, or, in, or, in front of the Senate and the House. You're on a committee. What's your, you're on the Science Committee. Yes, I'm on, two, I'm on two committees. One is called the Commerce Committee, but the full name includes commerce, technology, science, a lot of those things. And I'm on the Environment Committee, Environment and Public Works. So I'm on two of the main committees that deal with issues of science, technology, innovation. And they so, hear a lot of testimony, but they also meet individually with scientists and technologists from not just the White House, but from the Department of Energy, from the National Science Foundation, from NOAA. Their staffs meet all the time. So these are all the people who folks. they, uh, who, who the Senate approved? Yeah. So, so, you, so they can just summon you at will? Absolutely. And just bitch slap you when they feel like it? <laughs> Well, you know, when I used to testify, yes or no? <laughs> I, will, uh, I will comment that, that on days that I was testifying, we used to call that pinata day. Pinata day. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> they swing at you with a big stick and they hope to break you open and some candy will fall out. <laughs> Did they ever hope you would just help their kids with their science homework? Because <laughs> I once testified in front of the science committee of yes. the Senate and you either weren't there or you weren't a senator yet. I, was, I would be there, sir. I, I, I was not a senator yet. <laughs> but I, since I'm a citizen asked to testify, sure. I didn't feel like a pinata. I felt that they were just kind of gathering right. information. And I was commenting on the value of exploration, specifically space exploration, into a universe that has unlimited resources, especially the kinds of resources that on Earth we fight wars over. So I just thought I would highlight this fact. Yeah. And, and so, so I, I was intrigued because I didn't feel like I was making much of a difference. And I was just kind of going through motions and then they were going through motions and I didn't feel their energy. So I, I don't, so it does this work. When you give advice, are they actually listening? Sometimes, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Corey, when they give you advice, do you listen? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so I, 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 look, there's a serious problem with our politics writ large, but there is a massive area on these science committees in which I find bipartisan space to work with. And that's everything from, you know, I, was, I came to Washington and I saw that the 
the technology for drones, that we were losing all these companies because America, our, 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 our regulations were strangling that industry. I told the head of the FAA, if you were around during Orville and Wilbur Wright, we would have never gotten off the ground. And they were literally going to other countries like France and were years and years ahead of us in utilizing drones for mine surveys, for technology. And so I found partners there. Nuclear energy, next generation nuclear power is Thank not you for pronouncing nuclear correctly. Thank you very Come much. <laughs> <laughs> Other nations are now far more attractive to those the nuclear scientists because of our regulatory framework that doesn't look to the next generation nuclear energy, which is far safer, eats the spent nuclear rods from other other uh, uh, from from the current version, and we were going to be losing out on our edge in that technology. Well, here's something that we I can't need imagine: loosen laws about nuclear. We need to make some loose nuclear energy law. No, no. That's no, exactly we, what he no. said. No. What we need to be doing as a nation is we need to begin to have a government that moves at the speed of innovation. In other That's words- That's the whole third sector of this show. Right. We'll get back to that. Okay. What I want to know is, is one of the bipartisan uh, uh, points of agreement health? The National Institutes of Health. So is this, that what, that's got to be in there somewhere? Yeah, well, well, look, uh, uh, this Wow, person, that took too long to say yes, that's a no. No, <laughs> I know, right? Well, what happened was, uh, yeah, yeah, Senator, that's a quick yes, all right? <laughs> or, so we are, we are screwing up in the larger sense in our investment in biotech, and coming from a biotech and innovation and health space state, um, where New Jersey. New Jersey is, we are really screwing up in so many ways of this system. We're screwing up and not investing in it. Other nations are beginning to pull ahead in their investments in this area. We're, we're screwing up in, in the way the free market is contorting and making people's pre prescription drugs way too high price. I can go through the ways that this, this space frustrates the hell out of me, but what bothers me most is just the fact that Alzheimer's, my father died of Parkinson's just a few years ago, all of this that is costing us, these illnesses that are costing us so much money, we could be investing more in the cures to these diseases we could lead humanity out of the darkness of the pain like we look at other diseases we've conquered, but we're just not making a commitment as a society to, to put our resources, our energy, our talent, our spirit to solve John, it problem. sounds like you can combine that problem with an analysis and throw in some economics, and then you have an, an argument that has no holes, that everyone just agrees with, and then you, you create the policy, and then you move on. Well, Why we, isn't that happening? Well, some Don't of you, it, you, Everything some you say makes is. complete sense. Neil, some of it is happening. In the Obama administration, we started the Brain Initiative, which is making uh, tremendous advances in understanding how the brain works, which will help us ultimately figure out how to cure or avoid Alzheimer's, how to cure or avoid Or how to make better political decisions. Just, just that. <laughs> Does that still exist or is it just no, it still exists. like a bucket it, of balls? It, it, it still exists, maybe because I haven't found out about it yet. Uh, wait, so, wait, so Joe, what, what, can you think of biomedical advances that, that, that more people need to know about? Well, one of the big initiatives that I worked on, in fact, it was my first initiative in the White House, was precision medicine, which is the idea of using big data about big populations of people to tailor medicine treatment and prevention to the individual. So if you can sort of parse people into lots of different groups, and based on whether it's their zip codes or their genome or their microbiome, something like that, you can then make predictions about their health. And this is really the future of medicine. But I had kind of an interesting experience. This is my first um, memo to the president. We, John and I wrote this memo, and then we were invited a few days later, very quickly, to the Oval Office to meet with the president. You got to write memos to the president? Can yeah. we tell which ones will commit crimes and arrest them beforehand? <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw that movie, yeah, okay. So we had this great meeting and the president clearly had gotten precision medicine. So I walked out feeling pretty good. I said, John, he got it and this is pretty cool. And the next week I was sort of perusing some old legislation and I came across 2006 legislation written by Senator Obama on precision medicine. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I was simply crushed. <laughs> but that, I think, is an example of a bipartisan issue because when we rolled out precision medicine, we had as many Republicans as Democrats at the event. And just in December, the 21st Century Cures Bill, which supports precision medicine and the Brain Initiative and several other things, passed the Senate 95 to 5. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly bipartisan. 
He was in the five that didn't. No. <laughs> yeah, was your thank you sarcastic because he voted against it? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So, so it would Bible. seem to me that health would be the most bipartisan thing going. I agree. But then I'm, I'm surprised to see a proposal to reduce the funding to the National Institutes of Health. So I don't understand that. By almost $6 billion. Yeah, so Corey, what's up with that? Um, it, it is a... <laughs> It is. I, I, What's up with that? I've, uh, I've literally been in the scrum uh, during these large budget deals where that, exasperatingly, you're fighting to try to say, how can we be funding X, Y, or Z, like these broken programs that don't do anything, and we're not funding something as obvious as this, that frankly, I work in a body that we're all getting old. It's kind of a, a, one of the more uh, thoughtful senior bodies where a lot of these diseases are going to be visited upon us. And so I don't understand. If you forget about if you don't care about this country and you're not as much of a patriot as we all should be, but think about your family. Think about yourself. Why aren't we making more of an investment? And even worse, again, I keep repeating this over and over again, but we, we've heard of all about this president promising that we're going to win bigly, but, but, <laughs> but the, the reality is our competitors are making massive investments in terms of percentage of their GDP investing in these things. They're overtaking us. They're going to catch us and overtake us. And so I just look at what China is doing and what Germany is doing and what Russia is even doing in terms of what they're investing in. Even makes, Russia. I, I'm sorry. Right, I, right, uh, Corey, I, wait, I'm, I'm tired of something. I'm, okay. I'm angry. Yes. Okay. Bring it. Let your inner Jersey out. Just <laughs> hold me back. <laughs> so the day I realized, and this is a pretty, uh, I don't want to call it upsetting, but disturbing day for me. When I look back at America's uh, presence in the space race, okay, from 1957 onwards, the launch of Sputnik, until we landed on the moon, yeah, Essentially, every decision we made to go into space and what to do there was reactive to what Russia, the Soviet Union, had already done or was already planning. Every single move. They put in a first satellite, we put up a satellite. They put up a dog, we put up a chimp. They put up a human, then we put up a human. They put, and we are reacting at every time, at every turn. And I wonder, can a democracy be proactive or do we have to wait around until we feel threatened and only then do the pistons align for us to act the way we should? We're live at the Count Basie Theater. We're talking about the marriage of science and policy. And I've got a great panel up here. What we're trying to do is make America smart again. Trying to find out how science and policy come together to affect change for the greater good of us all. And Eugene, we're here for you. Yes, thank you. Well, so you, you want me to it's, it's still part of the Eugene Merman Comedy Festival. We can we set the yes, stage here? Yes, let's do it. Uh, uh, with me, uh, Barrett Tunde, everybody. Yeah. And <laughs> Ophira Eisenberg. And I've got John Holdren and Joe Handelsman, both who worked in Obama's office of science and technology policy, and very special guest who wandered off the streets onto the stage. We have New Jersey Senator Cory Booker. Cory. Hey, yeah. Neil. I, I, I hate to say anything defending the U.S. space program, but the Russians never put up the Hubble. We put up the Hubble without any... Oh, uh, snap! Son. <laughs> President from the Russians. But 20 uh, years later. We, we have, no, you, but you're talking about our reactive stance yeah. through, through the 60s. So, We've done a lot of things ahead of the Russians. Right, and ahead no, wait, of the, Hubble was peanuts compared with putting people in space. That's all I'm saying. So, oh, so cheap. So, but, 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 but scientifically not. Of course. Peanuts but at all. I, I got that, but most of the budget of NASA was always not science. So. Yeah, we tried to fix that. <laughs> and, <laughs> I want to get back to biomedical advances here. Do you think, though, that if ISIS tried to uh, uh, cure Parkinson's, we would then get on? <laughs> like, if they kind of shifted maybe their priorities, yeah. <laughs> we could get in a real race. So, Joe, what more advances are coming down the pipe? What can we look for? Well, I think one of the big areas that I'm excited about is microbiology, because we're starting to
to understand that not only the human body, but all ecosystems on Earth are driven in part by their microbiomes, which means their collection of microorganisms. The microorganisms that live on you and in you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like mostly probably in your intestines. Right, that's where a lot of them are, but also the skin, the ears, every orifice of the body. And this it is turns nasty. Out, no, no. no. And I'm thinking, you know, you tell anyone under 30 that everyone over 50 at one time would walk into something called a phone booth and take the receiver and put this side to their ear and this side to their mouth where a hundred other people had done it that day. So now you have shared earwax and mouth spill. But that illustrates... There's no but to that. That's just nasty. All right. There's Maybe that's why the though. older generation doesn't have all these allergies and diseases. We're like steeped in germs. Well, and that's right. And it, it points to exactly the issue that most microbes are not germs. They're not harmful to us. There are only about 80 species of germs, and there are thousands, if not millions, of other species of microbes. And so we don't think of them as the good guys, but in fact, they're keeping us healthy, controlling our behavior, controlling our vulnerability to disease all the time. But even, and I mean, I've read a lot of the research on this. I mean, every, even things like depression and a lot of things that we've been thinking have other uh, actives. Actually, our, our gut microbiome is affecting so much of our well-being, how we're dealing, uh, fighting That's a whole cancer. frontier now. It is an amazing yeah. frontier. Wait, that it has to do with depression? Yes. Tell, tell. Tell me. She was, yeah. she was telling me this backstage. I'm like, very curious. Tell me. <laughs> you, you tell me the microbes in my body are affecting the... Shoot. <laughs> I gotta say this because it was so cool. She was saying that there's some, you correct me if, if I'm wrong. I know I'll get some of this wrong. She was saying that there are microbes in you that actually like chocolate and communicate this fact to your, to your eating desires, and you say, gee, I want some chocolate, when in fact, it's your microbiome that's asking for it. That's right. We're that's totally true. driven by our bacteria, absolutely. Yeah. Not but, I, but I hate to tell you this, I mean, this is everything I'm reading is, there's good gut bacteria and bad gut and the bad gut bacteria really breathes off of empty carbohydrates and things like that. But if you really want to breed better gut bacteria, you need to eat more fiber, more vegetables, more, more plant-based diet. That's Five people right. are pro yeah. fiber in this audience. Laughing for carrots, bunch of jerks. Test, sorry. <laughs> so That's tell me about it. this this gene editing tool, CRISPR, that I've heard. That's an acronym, right? Yep. Because this sounds like it's the future of all biology. Well, I think it's very important because it lets us make very, very precise changes in genes or around genes. This is a tool for the, in the laboratory. That's that right. That can never go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Photoshop for genetics. I can't imagine what we could do wrong with that. What could go wrong? Yeah. So is can, there can a, grow hair a biologist <laughs> concerned about the ethics of that? Making well, new life or altering life to your own whims? Yeah, well, I think that was uh, a big issue when John and I were in the White House, was trying to figure out what are the limits to what we're comfortable with. And one that was clear, and the president said this in his policy, was that we're not going to edit the germline, which means the, the embryos that are forming. So we're not going to create heritable changes in people uh, in the test tube. Heritable would mean uh, the ability to transfer that from one generation to the next. That's right. Right. And so we're thinking more in terms of what used to be called gene therapy, where regular tissue, not your, your sexual tissue, but your skin or your heart or your lungs would be modified. So it would only have an effect in your lifetime. But that hasn't stopped the Chinese from doing exactly the experiments we decided not to do and affecting embryos and having gene changes that will be passed on. Do we have super soldiers? <laughs> I saw that movie. Or at least, yeah, yeah, but it sounds like it might be real. <laughs> or at least uh, people that live off of chocolate only. That would yeah. be cool. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me you can, you can if you can modify the individual, mm -hmm. you can... Um, you know, we joke about this, and I don't, I'm not even a fan of it, but people are imagining if you're going to live on Mars, just genetically modify you so that everything that's different about Mars is okay for your genetically modified body. And that way you don't have to live in a HAB module. That's an extreme case, mm -hmm. but clearly you could use this to cure us of our 
traditional diseases. Right. And so the human body has evolved over many millennia to be what it is today, with a few mistakes, certainly, but we haven't evolved to be on Mars. So <laughs> I don't think we're just going to make a That's few why tweaks. I, I just put that out there because people occasionally yeah. talk about it. Yeah. But is this real? And is NIH funding this research? And does Congress know about this? And are they behind Are it? you learning about it now? Here? Or, or, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's kind of saying, take a note. And have you watched Westworld? <laughs> <laughs> And so, can we delete the Republican gene? <laughs> <laughs> edit, Ophira, edit. Sorry, sorry. I know that's mind, con I, it's mind controlled and I'm for it. So, what is, so, so is there a, an, an awareness of the value of that, of that power? Incredibly, the good map value of that power. Yeah, inc incredibly so. I, it's not to where I would want it to be. I would like us to get back to being a science, technology, innovation, leading nation. And, and that's my frustration is the excitement that I get when I hear a scientist like this talk about what is possible. Um, I wish we could somehow uh, sort of expand the moral imagination of this country about what we are capable about in terms of leading the human race into a, into a safer, to a stronger, to a more prosperous world for all of us. And, and that's the challenge we have right now. I get back to this idea of what I think you play a good role in and, and we all have to accept responsibility in doing is we all, it, we can't expect the world to change unless we're willing to change and be a part of that change and lead that change. And so we all should be excited about science, excited about innovation. The more we get excited about it, the more that will ripple out. The more we demand our elected leaders are, the more, more likely they are to respond to our demands. And so what do you see are the, are the barriers between that goal and sort of making America smart in, in a way that we ha become wise, uh, wise shepherds of our future? Well, look, I, I, I want to be very blunt. We are going to have some very tough fighting years ahead of us. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, three plus years now of a president who has made it clear on many of these issues that he is contrary you know, that the Chinese made up global warming. Uh, you saw what the values of his budget he put forward. And so much of what I'm doing in Washington right now, still looking for partnerships across the aisle to get things done, but I'm preparing to fight a president that I think wants to take our, our country backwards in terms of science, innovation. Yeah, but, but so I, I, I don't beat politicians over the head, you know why? Because they're elected by an electorate, right? right. So, so you can beat them on the head, but and even get rid of them. But then there's the matter of the electorate that voted for them in the first place. Right. So, so your gripe is not actually with the president. Your gripe is with the 60 million people who voted for him. No, no. In fact, hold on. I, I don't think we. I don't think we get anywhere as a country when we are in the, in the course of demonizing each other. I think what we need to do. Well, I see this as a matter of education. If it's a matter, if if you're yes, saying, yes. if you're actually saying this policy will harm these people That's, and they don't know it, then somebody's got to educate them. Right, and I'll give you two quick examples. One is this is why the science march is so important, because when you when you saw the when you saw eight people are going to the well, science march. Well, we I was down in Washington for the women's march, and people didn't march around saying get. You know, there wasn't people with signs like beat Republicans. In fact, I bumped into women that were Republicans there that were against a lot of policy issues. But a lot of this right. is just, I, I saw no anti-Republican signs no, at all. No, not, not right. one. And, and there are a lot of innovative signs. Right. The March on Washington, you had people like Strom Thurmond, literally the longest filibuster in the Senate is a, a racist rant uh, by a man trying to block the civil rights legislation. But the March on Washington, look, listen to the speakers, John Lewis, Martin Luther King, they weren't speaking against those folks. They were calling to the moral imagination of this country. And what my frustration is, is often we, we, we are not engaged, we, we, we luxuriate in this incredible nation. We have the four most powerful words you can say as a human being. In fact, only four and a half percent of humanity can say, I am an American. And that comes because of the labors and the sacrifices and struggles of generations before. And this generation, we see what happens when we disconnect 
We see what's happening in Washington as a result of people not voting. I, I saw this one uh, a pie graph, you know, 50, you know, what is 60 million people voting for Hillary Clinton, 57 for Donald Trump, million voting for Donald Trump, and 74 million other people like, oh my God, look what just happened, you know? And so, and so I'll give a very real example of the EPA and what's happening right now. This isn't because of Donald Trump. This was happening under a great president that wished he could change it. We in our nation right now, where Ronald Reagan reauthorized and Mitch McConnell voted for a simple solution to clean up Superfund sites. These are corporations that create the most toxic spots on the, in all of America. There's a Superfund in every state. Unfortunately, New Jersey has the most of them. Now that, that has, that has- Lucky you. Right? <laughs> that has lapsed, that, that funding has lapsed because this Congress now, suddenly, not like Reagan, not like the old Mitch McConnell, decides not to reauthorize the cleanup for that. So there's all of these so-called orphan sites. There's no corporation anymore to go after to clean them up. But now we have something called data. When I was mayor, I learned this real quick. A lot of people come in with a lot of emotion, and I said, look, in God we trust, but everybody else bring me data. If you're not a deity, <laughs> show me the numbers. Well, now we have longitudinal data from Princeton University about what are the long-term effects of living around a Superfund site. And we now know that if you have a child around a Superfund site, there's about a 20% more likely of an increase in autism, 20% more likely of an increase in birth defects. So talk about a threat to our children. This isn't the Russians or ISIS coming. This is problems we have right here in our country that the only thing that's allowing these to proliferate, I have two Superfund sites in Newark that are close to where I live, but the only thing stopping us from doing something is decisions being made in Congress. But most of us don't even know that fact. So like we also, so, look, we have the gene editing, so we can just get that deployed there first. <laughs> I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that, that, that my, this is the greatest country on the planet Earth. I don't care what Donald Trump says, we need to make it great again. We are an amazing country with reservoirs of love and goodness and kindness, but something is missing. And it was missing in the 1960s too. It, it took geniuses. I remember Martin Luther King, if you know the, the history of Taylor Branch, he comes out of Birmingham jail after writing one of the greatest pieces of American literature, the letters from the Birmingham jail. But he was failing. Two young people with an imagination, Dorothea Cotton and James Bevel came up to him and said, hey, you're failing here, let us try something different. And the thing they did different was to organize other young people, ages eight to 18, to march against Bull Connor, to create the spectacle of 10, 12, 14, 16 year olds marching. And what Bull Connor did, he sprayed them with water hoses, the next time he released dogs on them. But suddenly people sitting home in Iowa and New Jersey saw this spectacle going on. Literally, the, the, the Soviet Union was making fun of our democracy on the front pages of their newspapers. And it so awoke that reservoir of love in this country. Within days, segregation fell in Birmingham because this country, when they decide to do something, nothing can stand in our way. And so the challenge is now. It just sounds like you gotta sink really low before you do something. I, I, I think what we need to do is find creative ways. I mean, you jokingly said, Snapchat about it, but I'm sorry. No, I've, no. Done, I've done the political. You should do it. I've done the, yes. <laughs> I've done the political science research about what influences people to act. And did you know the most persuasive thing to get your friends to vote is knowing if they're voting or not? is literally talking to your circle of friends, more than one of my campaign commercials in New Jersey, if, if somebody says, hey, everybody, I, I met Cory Booker, he's a great guy, vote for him, that's far more persuasive than anything I could put on TV or anything I can do. We have so much power. And so this is my thing, I don't think we need to light rivers on fire. <laughs> that was his idea. Yeah. I'm not crazy. His <laughs> idea was Russian that oh, said that. Oh, 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 Russian that. Said. I don't think we need to do it, I think it's effective. <laughs> <laughs> we, what we need to do is ignite our own spirits, and, and I promise you that that light will cast away some darkness. I just think we all need to say, what can I do different this year around issues of, that I care about, whether it's science or super funds or space exploration. Pick something and be an, a, a, a patriot in, with love in pursuit of, the, of, of that end, and you will make more of a change than you could ever imagine.
So, I, what I want to know now is beyond. Are we, do we have the policy in place to invent the future? Or again, are only, we only reacting to bad things that have happened in the past? So, John, let me begin with you. How much duties of your office was to have people think about tomorrow? A lot, and, and in fact, uh, you have on your list space exploration. Uh, when we entered office, we knew we had a challenge in space exploration because a lot of the science had gone out of NASA, a lot of the advanced technology had gone out of NASA. We had to rebalance NASA. We said we were putting the science back in rocket science, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and, Did it work? And, and uh, you know, we had, we had a bit of a struggle. That's uh, a no? Yeah. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> I'm sorry, it worked. Okay, we, we, did, we did rebalance NASA, and uh, a Just lot of good clear, stuff got done. You were in Washington for eight years. Eight years. Like that's like longer than any science advisor ever in the history of the universe. Well, of course, the history of the science advisor doesn't go back quite as far <laughs> as the history of the universe. Uh, it goes back to the the um, last term of Franklin D. Well, the, second to last term of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. So, but I was the longest serving science advisor in that period. Okay. So you had perspective. Well, sure, and, and, and of course, like everybody else and like you, uh, I had been watching. I was a space geek when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. I was making solid fuel rockets out of my mother's used lipstick tubes when I was nine. <laughs> they, they went about 100 feet in the air. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'd been watching it for a long time, and it was a pleasure to have the opportunity working with President Obama and working with Charlie Bolden, the NASA administrator, you made to get some things lipstick done. Tubes. No, did that it, hurt when your I was nine, check, I did that. When they did a background check, when they <laughs> found out that you blew things up as a kid? Well, that, yeah, it was a, a bit of a problem, but they decided to let me through. Okay. <laughs> Got one of those wavy. You made rockets yes. out of lipstick tubes. Little solid fuel rockets, yeah. <laughs> I had chemistry set ingredients that made the solid fuel. I made uh, time fuse, burned an inch a minute, so I could get away before it went off. Next time I've seen six-year-old boys in Sephora, I'll know what they're up to. <laughs> One hundred one things to do with lipstick tubes. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, I'm sorry. I was very distracted by no, that. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I apologize. It was my fault. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I'm back on track. But, okay, but go we on. did. We did get a lot done in reshaping. Uh, the priorities in NASA, more investments in the technologies that would be needed to go to Mars. You know, a lot of people are saying, why don't we go to Mars tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. Let's put the money in, and you know, Neil, as, as well as I do, that we don't yet have the technologies to send people to the surface of Mars and bring them back. Of course, there are some who are willing to take a one-way trip, uh, and some others who would be my candidates for a one-way trip. We have a one-way trip. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you're citing NASA in response to my question about the future. Is NASA the repository of our future hopes among agencies? No, it's only one. It, it just happens to be the a particularly visible. evocative one, and one that still, by the way, inspires young people in the way almost nothing else in science does. At the big science fairs we've had in Washington, the two exhibits that always attract the most attention are NASA and robots. Those are, those are the two that really do it, that get kids uh, going about science and technology. So how do you draw the line between the research you do that helps invent a future and the research that Congress will tell you you shouldn't be doing because corporations should be doing that as part of their R&D? Where's that line? It's gotta be somewhere in there. Well, well there is a, there's a fairly obvious line. In fact, the corporate sector funds more than two-thirds of all the R&D in this country, mm -hmm. but they fund less than half of the basic research, the fundamental research that's the seed corn from which all the, the future applied. The long horizon applied. research. And, and the reason the private sector doesn't do that is perfectly understandable. Time horizon is too long, the risk is too high, the return is too uncertain, and they're not sure that if there's a breakthrough from this basic research, that they, the corporation that paid for it, will get the benefits. And the but result I always is hear in Congress, the government needs to do it. The government needs to do that sort of basic research. It needs to fund it, yeah, or but it won't get done. When that happens, Congress stands up and says, why is taxpayer money being wasted on this research that has no application to any known thing on Earth? And of course, there the, examples of some of this terrible research? Well, yeah, the, I'll, I'll give you some. The nature of basic research is you can't tell where it's gonna go. Great example, Charles Towns, who got the Nobel Prize, for thinking up the science behind the maser and then the laser, 
had no idea when he did that work that 50 years later, lasers would be the way we do eye surgery, cut metal, copy documents, play movies, measure distances. None of that was obvious at the time the work was done. We even measured the distance to the moon yeah. with lasers. Folks, yeah. f- f- folks, I think lasers are worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Just my opinion. Here's another great example. There was a science project funded by the National Science Foundation many years ago. It was called The Sex Life of the Screw Worm. Yeah. And of the screw worm. I'm the screw worm. The sex life of the screw worm. That's a worm? And, 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 that's a real worm? And, and, a real worm. Guess and, what it and, does. And, and, <laughs> and there was a lot of fun was made of this in the Congress. I think it got Senator Proxmire's Golden Fleece Award, in fact. And the award but, but, given to but, but the greatest waste of The greatest waste of taxpayer taxpayers' money. money. And the fact is the screw worm was a livestock pest that did some hundred million dollars worth of damage every year to the livestock industry in the United States. And this basic research on the sex life of the screw worm led to a means of biological control of the screw worm, which basically eradicated it as a livestock pest. Was with that, a, a immense savings to the U.S. economy. Was that just a marketing failure, though? Like, shouldn't it have been called, like, save our agriculture business <laughs> research? <laughs> well, no, you can't vote against that. Yeah. The, 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 people, the people doing the research didn't know that that would be the outcome. That's the nature of basic research. And then they put condoms on the screw worms. <laughs> the safe sex for screw worms. <laughs> Better agriculture for America. <laughs> The, the, the solution was actually somewhat similar to that. Really? The, the solution was releasing sterile males, because it turns out that the screw worm only mated once, the female only mated once. And if the female mated with a sterile male, she was then done. no offspring. And so the idea and was she still you, had you, just a good release, time. you just release a ton. <laughs> <laughs> you just release a ton of sterile males yeah. and, and the screw worm goes out of business. Really? I can't believe we just spent 10 minutes well, they talking do about the same thing in more actually. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. No, that's fine. <laughs> you asked for an example. But we know, Corey, that there are people who don't, in Congress, both sides of the, both branches, that don't appreciate this. Absolutely. Just, there's people that don't. How do we get them to appreciate it? I, again, that's the, that's the political process. That's the sort of sausage making or screw warm funding It's process. not just education. It's not just examples like this. No, it's not. Why can't, it, why can't he stand up, give that example, I give three others, and they, these are tangible examples. Why doesn't that convince people? Is there missing part of the edu- K-12 education where the receptors aren't there for, for examples that might change their mind? Again, it, it is a, this is a process in which there's tons of competing demands and there are people that are dead set against this kind of science research and, and don't get the larger Is picture. it because they dug in their heels and that's it? That, I look, with respect, Neil, I think... No, I don't ever want you to respect me. Just, then with, just with, bring it out. Then with, I'll take then, care of you later. And with extreme <laughs> disrespect, <laughs> you're, you're coming at this as a scientist and you're leaning on these facts as if facts have ever always been enough. Any parent knows that you just tell the kid a fact once, why, don't, why do they keep misbehaving? I told them, if this happens, this will be the consequence. But we do it, because we have emotions, and we have tribalism, and we want to feel a sense of belonging. So I think some of these reasons that people are being obstinate, information alone is never enough to close a case. And so it's, it's an important first step, but you've got to build some layers on top of that telecom. Okay, in the day, it was called an ass whooping. That's, that's, what, that's how you convince right. someone, if the Not data facts. didn't otherwise work. <laughs> just, I'm, just, I'm just curious about that. There are other branches of, NASA, of, of the government other than NASA. Uh, I don't know if they, they were in your portfolio, but DARPA is something we've always heard oh, yeah. about. Defense, advanced research projects. Administration. Agency. And there's DARPA Agency. E. Huh? There's DARPA E. Which is? Which I, I'm very interested in. It's about its investments in, in alternative energy. Uh, so E for energy. Yes. yes. So these are, these are funded by the Defense Department of Defense. Department. Yes. Okay. Now, ARPA E is funded by the Department of Energy. Okay, but they're both, neither of them are in OSTP's portfolio. Oh, they are. Oh, they are. Oh, they are. OSTP has oversight of all the science and technology. No matter who's the, doing it. No matter who's doing it. Oh, okay. Uh, and we work together with the departments and agencies in developing the president's budget. So uh, tell me about robots. You, you, you said robots get everybody's attention at the yeah. science fairs. No, absolutely. And I know DARPA's been making some robots. Absolutely. Ah. Uh, well. <laughs> I, yeah. <Okay. laughs> 
made it sound naughty, First but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> would it help to just reframe all our science as a weapon? Yes. But, but look, I, I mean, the, one of the reasons why we can get a lot of very good research done through the Department of Defense, because it's often easier to get people to fund the, de the Department of Defense than it is to get them to fund some of these other agencies. So because that's they, they, they're invoking the I don't want to die urge. Right. If the screw was a weapon, there'd be no problem. Yeah, there, look, right. there is a battle going on right now about defense spending versus domestic spending, yeah. and this idea of should there be parity in the increases and the like. Um, but I, I just have a question because I got two scientists here, and something I've read a lot about when you talk about larger planetary threats, um, isn't there a real threat of an uh, EM pulse, for example, uh, a naturally occurring one that could really knock out America's infrastructure? Yes, is the short answer. Yeah. You happy now? <laughs> I'm not happy. I'm, just, I'm, I'm one of these people that wants to see more infrastructure. Tell everyone about your EM pulse. No. We, Wait, is the Matrix real? Yeah, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> right, the Matrix had an EM pulse to get rid of the, the uh, robot squids that eat the, the squiddy, the squiddy thing. Yeah. What are they called? The Sentinels. You guys didn't see the Matrix? I oh think. my God. The so, there, so there are two kinds of electromagnetic pulse. One is if you explode a nuclear bomb in the atmosphere, among many other things, it generates a pulse of electromagnetic energy that can fry the electronics in your cell phone, in your car's ignition, in the controllers of the electricity grid, and so on. So that's one of the many good reasons not to explode nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Is that it will ruin your phone. It will ruin your phone. <laughs> And ruined like you would need a new phone. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. the, uh, didn't the Nokia 7 or have one of these problems? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, Samsung 7. Samsung yeah. 7. But, but the natural yeah. version of an electromagnetic pulse is when a solar storm. A solar flare. A solar flare throws charged particles in the direction of the Earth and they interact with the Earth's magnetic field in a way that generates a pulse of electromagnetic energy at the surface, and that too can fry your phone, your electricity grid, and everything else. And this, this, has, this has happened. It has happened. Well, on a massive scale. It happened scale. in Canada. It, Thank it, goodness. It's happened in modern times. It happened in a part of Canada. But Ottawa? it also happened, there was an event in the, in the late 19th right? century yes, yeah, late that, that, that if that was so severe, it knocked out telegraph uh, over a very large area, but there wasn't much electrical equipment in those days, right. and so it didn't do that much damage. But we know that if an event of that magnitude occurred today, it would be devastating. Could cripple and, our country. And, and, so and we're as a result, with the sun. As a result of that possibility, we have invested now substantial effort in trying to build a multi-pronged strategy to protect us from those kinds of events. That, strategy, I, I, that well, strategy includes sensors on the Discover satellite to give us early warning. The strategy includes the ability to disconnect parts of the electricity grid on warning very quickly. But there are other things that we should be doing and that the study recommended that we do that we're not yet doing. Right. And that's something that I'm very glad you're interested no, in. No, this is my point. This is the things I read. Uh, there's yeah. too much I read that okay. I get now worried. That's not all you should be worrying about. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we should be worrying about that as a, as a, as a globe. Yeah, when is this happening? <laughs> yeah. We don't know. Okay. You want to protect your phone. <laughs> not predictable. <laughs> so, so uh, there's not only that, there's, there's all this talk about AI running amok. And does the United States have a major investment in this, the future of this technology? So we've and basically gone from the Matrix to Terminator now, but keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Both happy movies. Can we just yeah. ask a regular, like, in my regular life, about how scared should I really be? Like, uh, like a one out of ten. Like a six? So, but let me get, so AI, let me ask you this. I, we had Ray Kurzweil as a guest on Star Talk, mm -hmm. and I was delighted by that conversation because I'd only known of him from what other people wrote. And I finally got the horse's mouth, and, and I, I love the guy to no end. Uh, just he's a deep thinker, he's brilliant. And so what I ask, there's a lot of talk about connecting human biology to the internet mm -hmm. in some way so that your brain is now actively processing the world. Mm -hmm. And do you see this biologically as a real thing coming down the line? I think so. I don't think it's... Yes! Yes. I don't think it's imminent. I, I think that's a way ways off. 
But we're steps, we're steps there already. There's, there's biologics you can put inside of yourself that yeah. are gonna be able to monitor, distribute medicine. All, your doctor could literally sit at a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, we're getting close to that and be able to deliver you doses of medicine based upon the information they're getting over distances about what's happening inside of your body. And that's precision medicine. We yes. were talking about it before. Yeah. All right, so, but, how, but AI now is making decisions that I didn't authorize, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the big fear is that AI, and I tweeted this once, I said we better behave, because when AI achieves consciousness, we want to give it as few reasons as possible to exterminate us, okay? <laughs> so, people, so are, people are clapping for extermination <laughs> by AI. No, I think they agree, right? They're like, don't worry, Arnold will save us. <laughs> <laughs> so is there an agency that's thinking about AI? Surely sure. the... John Terry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, many, many meetings in the White House about AI, many of them including President Obama, who's very interested in it and concerned about it. Did he write it, a paper on it? It has an upside. Uh, it has no. an upside in, in terms of increasing uh, the capacity to get a lot of important things done. It has a downside, like many technologies. If it's misused, if it evolves in a bad direction, it could be problematic. And so the question is, how do you manage the evolution of this technology in a way that gets the benefits while minimizing the dangers. But my own view is that the dangers as we currently understand them are being overstated. The proposition that computers are going to become in some general sense smarter than humans sometime soon is not believed by many of the experts in the field. There are some who think it will happen there are many who think it won't happen. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be vigilant and trying to figure out how to make sure that AI doesn't evolve in a way that takes over our lives. But can I tell you where AI scares me right now and is real, is that our enemies, sorry Eugene, like Russia, uh -huh. um, um, I'm a US American, citizen, Jack. just to be clear. <laughs> sorry. To I mean, I'll blend in if they win, but. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, so we have a real problem in this country with cyber attacks. And one of the reasons, one of the areas in which AI technology is now being used, look, Russia and China will never beat us tank for tank, warship for warship. We spend more money on military, have a bigger military in the next six, seven countries combined. But where they can now offer a threat, we just saw this with a massive cyber attack, uh, is, uh, is with what the advancements that are being made in hacking and that kind of technology. And AI is being used, uh, invested in, and explored by the Chinese and the Russians as a way of having a far more intelligent way where the computer can itself begin to learn about what the defenses are of a system and better break into them. And so when you see our competitors, and remember it's not just Russia, it's China, who's doing an extraordinary job stealing business technologies and the like, using these very sophisticated AI, blockchain, all these, these new next generation sort of uh, technologies and innovations against us and beating us to the punch, it's a massive vulnerability for our nation that we should be very aware and be so that's, concerned about. So that would come under the Department of Defense. But, but the Department of Defense, other than the DARPA and the DARPA E, is not really as equipped, it seems to me, to attract the, the, the best and the brightest to solve that problem. Well, yeah, I, I don't think that's quite right. The Department of Defense includes the National Security Agency. National Security Agency employs more PhD mathematicians okay. than any other organization in the world. Yeah, you got it. They are thinking about AI extensively, as is DARPA. Uh, which has a lot of smart folks as well. I'm not saying there's no problem. I agree with the senator. This is a big risk. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a big area of competition. Uh, our adversaries are very busy. We're very busy too, by the yes. way. And AI can be used to defend our cyber systems, just as it can be used by our adversaries to attack them. So this is an ongoing. So we can put our AI tension. against their AI, and then just let them fight, and we go off, go to the park. Yeah, that's something. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let me just get into your lives for a moment. Each of you left academic posts to serve in the White House. And is the, you're, you became a sort of a citizen scientist servant of, of needs. What, what each of you, what, what drove you to do that? Well, for me, there were two factors. One was John Holdren, the other was Barack Obama. 
Oh, they okay. were <laughs> totally imp okay. impressive intellects, committed to science. And I think John convinced me when we first talked about the position that working for this president would be a privilege beyond all else for a scientist, and he was right. It was an honor to work for a president who cared so much about science. So nine years ago, what were you, what were you thinking? Well, f first of all, I had had the good fortune to meet President Eisenhower's second-term science advisor, George Kistiakowski, when I was 29 years old. And he became one of my mentors, and I learned a lot from him about his service for Eisenhower. Then I met Jerry Wiesner, who was JFK's science advisor, and he became a mentor. And I ended up knowing every science advisor to every U.S. president from Eisenhower on. So if and you so I had, a secret, I had a secret ambition <laughs> as a result of all those interactions that I might someday be a president science advisor, and I just happened to luck out and get the best president in modern times to be the science advisor too. If there were a president who you didn't like, but asked you to be his or her science advisor, what would you say? Well, it would depend on the president. Why? Uh, if you're asked to advise them, why should it depend on the president? It depends on you. you no, know, you, you, ha you have to believe that the president will listen. You have to believe wait, 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 the president wait, wait. is interested, if you're not that he's an not just trying to check all, the box. If you're, not if you're not even in the room, they're clearly not listening to you because you're not in the room. No, that's true. So then there's a chance they'll listen to you if you're in the room. You have you to figure out whether you're going to be more effective advising this particular president or more effective pursuing the same issues from outside. From outside. You have to okay. make that decision. It, it can't always work to yell science into a wig. <laughs> <laughs> but, can, but can I just say something about these two doctors that's extraordinary and people should recognize this. The whole idea of our country in the Declaration of Independence, which this genius document, but frankly had flaws. It was, you know, referred to Native Americans as savages and all the flaws of the genius of the writers at the time that they had flaws, but the, 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 they kind of came to a conclusion at the end where they basically said for this country, the idea of this nation, which was not founded like other countries because we all look alike or pray alike or descended in the same way. This was, the idea of this country was the first nation of ideas and principles. And that's a tenuous, especially then, it was a tenuous way of forming a nation. And so what these two doctors really represent to me is what our founders said is going to have to happen. If this country is going to make it, they basically said, we have to have an unusual commitment to each other that goes beyond just tolerating each other or, or kind of admiring each other. They basically said we have to commit to each other, and this is the final words of the Declaration of Independence, we must mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And it's something we all should think about. Are we living our lives this way? These folks, and they're very humble, but trust me, they could have probably made a lot more money, yep. um, a lot more resources. You don't like, get rich working in government. You do not get right. rich. But these are folks that said, you know what? My love of this country, my sacred honor, my commitment of my fortune will be to this nation's goodness. And, and it's been those folks who are those irrational people throughout history who may not even make it into the history books, but have had consistently had this commitment, those people that built the greatest infrastructure this nation has ever known, most of them whose names aren't known, the Underground Railroad, those people who, I can't name the people who, whether they stormed beaches in Normandy or, or sat in laboratories designing technologies and innovations that I use every day, but I, I, take, it, I take for granted. And so I just want to thank them publicly because they don't often get a moment like this before a huge audience. Hardly ever. Hardly ever to get the kind of gratitude and celebration that we do. So thank you very, very much. Let's bring up the house lights and we'll take some Q&A. We'll do this for like 20 minutes. We got a few minutes. Uh, I don't know, did we have microphones? There's a microphone on the aisle there and we have another microphone on the aisle there. Okay, so who's the first person up? Right there, okay. Go ahead. Wait, wait, the, you turn that on? Hang on. <laughs> yeah, we got it now. Go ahead. We know how black Wait, wait, just wait. Wait, wait, how old are you? Uh, six. Wow. Wait, how old are you? Six years six. old. You're six? Yes. <laughs> Well, welcome to Star Talk. I hope we didn't use too much grown-up language here. 
Yeah, sometimes we do. My, I, apologize. I apologize. But I bet we didn't use any language that, you're, that you never heard your parents use, you see? So I bet. <laughs> so uh, what is your question? Hold the microphone right in front of your mouth. Yes. We know how black holes form to supernovas. How do supermassive black holes form? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's a little off topic, kid. <laughs> uh, uh, Senator, can you answer that? For me? <laughs> um, so, uh, high mass stars, when they die, they leave behind a black hole as a remnant. You want to avoid that, but it's, it's, the, there'll be many of those across the galaxy, but there are black holes that are much more massive than that, one per galaxy in each galaxy center and those we call supermassive black holes, and we don't really have a good idea of how they form. <laughs> so, so I can't help you. But, but if you are asking that question now, okay, here's the challenge. When we are born, the parents spend the first few years teaching us to walk and talk, and then they spend the rest of our lives telling us to shut up and sit down. <laughs> Clearly in your case, your curiosity is burning within you. If you carry that curiosity into adulthood, you may be the first person to discover how supermassive black holes occur. Woo. Woo. Right over here, yes. Yes, whoa. Hello, Hello Dr. Tyson, Senator Booker, everyone there on the panel, thank you very much for coming. My question, well firstly let me say, Dr. Tyson, you said that you don't believe in hope, and I wanna say something that we've all probably heard since before Christmas is that revolutions are built on hope. Um, so also, I wanted to ask Senator Booker, you had mentioned about the super fun sites that we have throughout New Jersey, and I wanted to also uh, discuss with you, since this is the Garden State, and we like to do a lot more of our own gardening, and you had mentioned trying to return more to a plant-based diet, Many of the things that we use in our own yards are not good for the environment. They're not good for the food that we're eating, and they're not good for the things that we use in our own gardens. And what are you doing as a senator to help us bring more ecologically sound and more environmentally sound things to our own gardens that are not being you know, pushed as they should be? That's a great question. We can broaden that to say, how, what kind of things can we and should we do locally that will matter globally. Is that a fair yes. uh, extension that, of that, that question? Fine. Sure. So uh, I just want everybody to know that there's a farm bill reauthorization coming up. It was yeah. days when I came into the Senate that I voted against it because of a lot of reasons. One, it made a massive cut to food stamps, but also because they gave massive subsidization to these massive corporations who engage in farming practices that are polluting the soil, mm -hmm. polluting our rivers, and, and, didn't, and subsidizing them with our tax dollars, subsidizing things that we tell Americans not to eat. Our government on one hand tells you not to eat this stuff, and then we're subsidizing on the other hand, so that when kids in, you know, I'm going back home to Newark tonight, when kids in Newark walk into a bodega and see a Twinkie product cheaper than an apple, it's because we're subsidizing that stuff. And the reality is, then those kids are getting type two diabetes as children and we have to subsidize that healthcare. So what I'm saying is, this food system we have needs a lot of repair. And so what I believe in, and uh, exciting me that you're answering this question, I started it when I was mayor, is I love this idea of locally grown, locally sourced things, and we should be encouraging that kind of agriculture in our communities. The Farm Bill actually got some stuff in there. I think it was good about locally grown organic uh, stuff, but I think more of it should be. So the end of the answer I would say is, find out what's happening with this coming big reauthorization bill. Let's work together. You're one of my constituents. Reach out to my office. I have a group of people that are very passionate on my staff about this Farm Bill and what we could be doing to support the kind of local farming you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And Excellent. New Jersey is one of the leaders in local farming I love and, that you know and that. urban farming. Y yes, yeah, right. yeah. we're in local farming, we're a farm state, and urban farming. In fact, when I was mayor of Newark, we created Newark as the largest Wait, that's urban, a thing? urban farming. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's a we thing? Acres yeah. and acres, it's a good way to banish food deserts, and exciting stuff is happening in urban farming. Roof gardens, there's a company in New Jersey called Arrow Farms, which uses very little vertical farming, all these innovations, less water. It's really exciting stuff. Cool. Let's see if we can answer our questions a little quickly because we have a thousand trillion people online. Yes, right here. 
Um, this one is for everyone, but especially Joe as a female scientist. I have three daughters, nice. ages 12, 10, and almost four. And they start off really inquisitive and, and the six-year-old, and they want to know about black holes. And, and my daughter, my oldest, is, is in middle school now, and she has won in her elementary school her science fair. And she was, thought it was the coolest thing and still into science. And now in middle school, you could see that tapering off and, and a disinterest for females especially, but for her in science. And how do you, how do you propose that we keep that curiosity, as you have said, and especially for women, because women don't make up. I work in a job who doesn't have a whole lot of women either, but that's a construction. How do we keep the women wanting to do science when they're not encouraged to do so? Well, I think that's a, a great question, and we can all play a role in that by encouraging girls to do it and showing them role models. One of the reasons that girls turn away from science in middle school is they're starting to come to grips with being women, and they think, well, I have to be a woman or a scientist because they often don't see examples of normal, healthy, exciting women that run marathons or uh, have kids or do whatever it is that women do. And so one of the things we worked on in the White House and that I continue currently is how do we change the image of science and technology in Hollywood? And I think they can play an enormous role in inspiring our girls and minorities to be scientists just by showing the whole breadth of scientists and the jobs that they do. So it's a great question. On a small scale, we could just encourage them and show them examples. Yes, over here. Hello, my name is Emily. I've spoken to you once before. You probably don't remember me. <laughs> But um, I know this is slightly off topic. I was wondering if I could have your autograph. <laughs> <laughs> talking to you? No, she's talking to you, tell me. Yes, oh, you. My, my autograph. Oh. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you leave something with an usher, I'll be happy to do it after the show. All right. Uh, I'll be happy um, to do it. And you're wearing a NASA shirt, or does that say something it, else on it's it? It's a rogue NASA shirt. It says cool. rogue on it. Okay. Rogue. Yeah, it's got it's it's in the it's it's in the spirit of what we're doing. So give yes. give something for me to sign to an usher and I'd be happy to do All so. All right. Okay. Am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah. Then? Thank you. So did you also have a question? Um yes, really quick. You did. If and we try ask... to keep the questions quick yeah. so we can get through the line. Go. If I could ask Senator Booker. Yes. Um I was just thinking, I've talked with my parents about this before. For like the younger generation. What could we possibly do besides just protesting? Like, I've been to a women's march, but like, is there anything else that the younger generation can do since we're basically what's going to be the future of politics and science? Yeah, so there's, there's, I'll take this. Can I, can I, uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, can I add to that? Um, why is it that the most effective protests are only the ones that turn violent? Because then they make more headlines across the country. So I disagree completely with that statement. I do too. Um, the most effective protests are the ones that forge connections between those who show up. They're ones that change the narrative of how the media covers an issue. They're the ones that encourage people to follow up with that protest by voting, by running for office themselves, by joining a local group that is embedded in their community. So the violence is a spectacle. It's often a distraction forged by people who don't want to see change happen. That is not an effective protest. That's a failure, and it's disruption by those who oppose it. For young people who want to do stuff besides protest, yo, just be curious, like Neil said. Run for something. Like, represent your people somewhere, whether it's like your school board within your school itself. If you have the opportunity to represent others, that's giving to other people. And that's, you're living what you're asking others to do. And that's the best way to kind of change the world around you. Stop asking others to do it and do what the senator says. Do it yourself at the level that you can achieve. That's the beginning. Thank you. <laughs> I got you, baby. I got you. <laughs> the protege thing going. Again, quick, quick questions, okay, please. So I've been teaching public school for eight years. I Whoa, just no, say. that's a public <laughs> school teacher. Give it up. Yeah. Uh, how, are, are my students' brains, uh, this is kind of like abstract, but are they evolving using these cell phones quicker than our brains used to without them? And how can I catch up with my lessons to get them engaged you know, with this, once they take it out, they're gone. So uh, can you help me out with that a little bit? Anybody? It's a biological thing here. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you got, a bi you got a biological reply to that? 
Uh, well, you have the wisdom of age. I would go with that. Okay. Thank you. There's no hope. <laughs> you are the right. <laughs> All right, quick. Oh, we got, oh, we got some people up top that want to... Wow. Right oh, we have a microphone up there. I didn't see that. I'm sorry. All right, let's do it right here. Right there, go. Hi. Oh, <laughs> where's the person? I hear you, yes. Uh, I'm glad you do. Um, I work at the uh, Motion Center Policy. for Independent Living, and I'm wondering what uh, policy oh, and... Uh, oh. What policy and uh, science can do for the welfare of people living with disabilities? Wow. Ooh. So much. So much. Yeah. Ooh. This is a broader health issue, yeah. correct? Yeah, there's exciting yeah. things for. Uh, I think there are really exciting things coming forward uh, using technology. Uh, to compensate for what people can't do, either because of age or disability. And I think that technology is really going to be developing fast in the next few years because the demand for it will be increasing as our, our citizenry uh, ages. So I think it's a really great time for those kinds of questions. But I think we need to look at how people actually live. And there are some studies uh, that use virtual reality to study how people actually live in their homes or wherever they live, uh, and, and then develop technology around that. And I think that's much more accurate than trying to imagine how people live, which is unfortunately how a lot of that research has been done in the past. A lot of assumptions. Made. Well, plus there'll be a difference between supporting someone who has a disability and then repairing the disability outright. Right. right. Which, mm -hmm. in principle, could happen one day. Yes. And then we all live a life. Uh, we live um, active lives until we die, mm -hmm. rather than active lives until we get infirmed, yep. and then stay infirmed until we die. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be a very different kind I of I might life. add that it won't be too long before we're 3D printing new organs, so that the organ wait list that now exists for transplanted organs uh, will become a thing of the past because we can 3D print new organs. The second thing what? I'd note for nerds. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 cool. it's happening. Uh, it's yeah. not happening. your printer at home, it's a different kind yeah. of printer. Oh, it's yeah. different yeah, it's now. Different oh, yeah. But it's happening. I was going to say, and mine doesn't the, take blood. This one takes more toner than usual. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and for the nerds out there who are interested in this particular question, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology did a report in the past year on technology to assist with aging which doesn't address all of the questions that the questioner had in mind, but it addresses some of them. And that report is online in the Obama archive. Okay, cool. Let's take another one from up top, yes. Um, so, as a college student, I actually go to um, an engineering university, and I was just wondering, Mr. Tyson and uh, Senator Brooker, what do you think your opinion is on how college students out of college after graduation can get that experience to make those changes in the science and technology field? Um, do you want to enter? Do, do you want to become a scientist or become a... I'm actually an aerospace engineering major um, at Stevenson. Hopefully. That's good. So you're there. So... I also have a, a tattoo of Pluto that if you want to roast me for, that's okay too. Pluto had it coming, so just don't get me started. Uh, so are you asking what pathway might you take to be in service as my two esteemed colleagues here have been? Yeah, because like I, you know, you're applying for endless internships, there's giant pools of yeah. applicants. Just what do you guys think? How do you, that your how do you get in? Is? How do you get in? Well, it's interesting. You, first of all, depending on your level, you can apply for some of the uh, very interesting fellowships in science and public policy, the AAAS fellowships, the American Chemical Society fellowships. But the other thing you can do is you can just present yourself at an office. Uh, we hired some folks at OSTP who just walked in the door and said, we'd like to help. Uh, some of them walked in the door and said, we're so interested in helping, we'll help for nothing. We took those first, of course. Um, <laughs> and, and, and some of them did such wonderful work, we decided to pay them. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, you basically uh, need to step up and have confidence that if you present yourself and talk about what you want to do and what you could do, you may well get a post, may yes, well get a well, position. One policy request that you could really help me with because it's something I'm fighting for, but if you're a STEM uh, subject person, frankly, college folks 
in New Jersey really faces threat, and you want to go in and public service and do things like this, you should not have college debt. And it's something we need to do as a country, stepping up and removing these barriers. Because again, our competitors, Germany, and I can go through the nations who are dramatically lowering the cost of, of colleges and universities. So thank you for your desire to serve. And this nation be, should be liberating you from the tens of thousands of dollars of debt that, many, that our average uh, uh, college graduates are carrying. And I want to pick up on a point John made. There aren't, uh, for so many jobs that you see that, are, that have high luminosity, there is no actual path that guarantees you will land in those spots. Often, it is the tenacity of the person who ultimately occupies that spot that got them there. So you, know, you can't be an actor and say, I wanna be a famous actor just like this person, what do I need to do? I'll do exactly what they did. That, because what they did may have been a unique path to that point. You gotta find what be, might be the unique path for you. And is it interning at an aerospace company that actually has people in Washington who are talking to members of Congress? They're, they're, so it's, it's not a pre-scripted, uh, it's not a pre-scripted um, route. And it takes the tenacity at each point, at each pivot point of your career, to ask yourself, what do I need to do, whether or not someone has done that before you. Well, the great example is John, who stalked everybody who had his job before yeah, him <laughs> for years. So stalking, yeah, like yeah, systematically, yeah. all the predecessors. Of people to stalk. I hate it. I closet for three Neil, hours. I have one more question. <laughs> Can I possibly get a picture with you in that awesome vest? Oh. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> We're now selfie Can I from maybe a distance. Come closer afterwards. I'm wearing a shirt with your face on it. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, so almost every shirt that exists out there with my face on it is like bootleg. So I'm trying to rein that in. Uh, but so if, if you if you come down, I, I'll be here and you take a picture, okay? Uh, we only have time for like a couple more questions before we call it quits. Let's go right here. Yes. Um, you know, we're around. talking about making America smart again, but every time I go online, I see a, a lot of stupidity that's rampant. And a lot of it's irrational. You know, conspiracy theories. Earth is flat. We didn't go to the moon. You know, we 9/11 uh, truthers, GMO stuff. How can we, as a society, combat that really irrational stupidity? Yeah. I, I, let me offer a reflection, but then I'll defer to my panelists here. Uh, so the internet is the greatest access to knowledge there ever was. But you also have this delusion that no matter your thought, if you type in a search for it, you will find everyone else in the world who has as crazy a thought as you just typed in, validating what you think is real because of how many other people share the view. And so the search engines what the, maybe they should say, do you realize, <laughs> do you really want to search this? Are, are you, <laughs> do you take this breathalyzer before we send you? I mean, I, what, what's missing, you, know, you know what's missing? Internet savvy 101 in school, all right? Somewhere in school you gotta be taught that some information is more likely to be true than others depending on its source, okay? This, at some point, we need to learn that. And it's not in the K through 12 curriculum, last I checked. So that's a problem. And the flat earthers, I, you know, I don't have a problem. This is a free country. You can say what you want, think what you want. You want to think the earth is flat? Go right ahead. But try not to become head of NASA if you think that way, okay? <laughs> and plenty of jobs for you if you want to think the earth is flat. Plenty of jobs you can have. So, so yeah, if this keeps up, Corey, I don't know what the future of the country is if this kinds of, of anti-scientific thinking spreads, becomes sort of infectious, then we just go over the, the, the waterfall. We gotta be the antibiotics then. Match the lies with truth. Fight it just as hard. It's, it's just like technologies of old, television, radio, it's a, it's, a, it's a neutral platform where a lot of people are getting on, it's a contest of ideas, and we've got to match the, those lies with truth and, and be purveyors of it. Mm -hmm. Next up, yes. Hi. Um, so I wanted to know what your thoughts were on the Event Horizon Telescope and the possible recent photography of a black hole for the first time. 
and you know the, the whole will it look the way we think it looks so you think there'll be anything not unknown there maybe or so Corey can you take this sure <laughs> <laughs> no I actually know very little about that telescope okay. um, about photographing black holes Black holes alone are not very photogenic yeah. because they're black. That's racist. Um, that's, that's racist. racist. That's, that's racist. racist. I, don't that's like racist. This. I don't like this one bit. That's not cool. <laughs> not cool. Um, but black holes can render their existence visible by indirect means. For example, in the flaying of a star whose outer layers are spiraling down within, and then that toilet bowl style sucking uh, action is it radiates copiously in ultraviolet and x-rays and use an ultraviolet telescope and an x-ray telescope and they pick them out all across the galaxy. So it's just a testament to the methods and tools of science that demonstrate that the five senses that we are biologically endowed with are wholly inadequate to decode the actual operations of nature. And so uh, that's what telescopes do for us. But otherwise, I'm not, I'm not up on, on the Event Horizon telescope. I, I'm embarrassed, I should know. Uh, but I um, like to be candid in my ignorance. Yeah. So there it is. You, <laughs> Thanks for not trying to pass laws based on that ignorance. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. If you're ignorant, yeah, you should just be self aware of that yeah. and not try to create legislation based on it. <laughs> uh, let's go up top one more time. I, oh, wow. Uh, I'm a high school senior, and next year I'm going to school to study physics in a large part due to you and the things that you. Put out there. Oh well, thank you. So wow. thank you. Um, my question is for you and uh, Senator Booker. Um, someone once told me you you can't reason someone out of something they didn't reason themselves into. Mm -hmm. How do you fight that? And uh, if that whether yeah. it's evolution or public policy or right? yeah, I think that statement is like eighty five percent true. And so um, I think. It, it implies that winning an argument involves reason. But winning an argument can involve demonstration, right? If someone doesn't think there's global warming, you just invite them to buy property on the ocean's edge. And then you just step back. <laughs> they convert very quickly and you didn't have to lay down a single argument. So, so I think there are ways of convincing people that don't involve logical arguments. And this, uh, we need to be more savvy about what method might be best invoked given the person, given the situation. And I, as an educator, invest a stupid amount of energy, mental energy, thinking about what are, what are, the, the, what are the thought pathways that occupy the person who I'm communicating with. And I then align what I'm trying to say with those thought pathways so that I can maximally um, uh, uh, send information into you on a level where you can take ownership of it. And you can say, wow, I never knew it that way. Oh my gosh, I figured it out. I understand it now. That takes a key. And sometimes it's a different key for every single person. And that's hard. That's a higher level of expectation from an educator than just lecturing against a chalkboard, hoping that you walk up behind and pick it up and understand what's going on. One piece of quick advice for me real quick, and I learned this the hard way when I was young, I finally had this aha moment, so this is simply the piece of advice. You do not have to attend every argument that you are invited to. <laughs> <laughs> We've got another uh, person here. By the way, you have one of the very few official shirts uh, issued by Star Talk. yes. That's awesome. Uh, yes, go on, a question. Get close to the mic. I, as a middle school student, and many other middle school students out there, are being told to sit down and shut up more than ever. Why is that, and what could we do about it? Stand up and shout. <laughs> yeah, so you're in middle school now? Yes, I am, in eighth grade, so I'm going to be going into high school soon. Yeah, yeah, so your teachers are saying the good students are the ones that are quiet and obey. Yeah, to a point. Some allow questions, some don't. To an extent. Yeah, um, so one of the challenges to the middle school teacher is that you all are harmonial, har hormonally <laughs> crazy at this point. <laughs> hormonally, har 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 hormonally, hormonally, hormonally out like of control. You're like a screw worm. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah. Do that. Uh, so, I, you know, I can't go in there and like slap the teachers. I, I, but if you know that your curiosity and your energy for life and exploration is a good thing, then sure, behave in class. But when you get out of class, misbehave. <laughs> you, you have my permission to do that. Do you realize, I, in a few years, I'm gonna publish a book. Don't ask me about it until it comes. I'm gonna publish a book that will contain my academic record in it. And it will contain comments from my elementary school teachers who complained constantly that my energy was disrupting the class. I was a bad student for that reason. And I was not the teacher's pet. The teacher's pet was the person who was quiet, got high grades, and exactly obeyed everything the teacher said. And I had this energy, and I would crack jokes, and I would, I would show people stuff, and I'd bring uh, the urban equivalent of a frog to class. And, you know, so. Basically a rat. That would create a disruption. And so, none of those teachers would have said, he'll go far. The equivalent of a frog. None of them. Did, did you bring street rats to class? Yeah. <laughs> Were you trying not to say that? I'm that, trying to figure out that, that too. This is not cool. <laughs> so, like I said, you will spend many more hours outside of school than in school. So use the time outside of school to misbehave all you want. And, that, and there's the secret to becoming something greater than the student who obeys every single command that a teacher hands them. I, forgive me, but we have time only for one more question. We're gonna take it right I, here, go. I, I just wanna to say to that young lady, can I just say real quick, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh. So the young lady, you don't have to come back to the microphone, but look, there are a lot of times, and even in the, as a United States Senator, where I have to shut up. And, and be silent. And there are times where I, I don't want to be, but my only thing, simple point to you, and you said it in the, in the larger context, but allow somebody in authority, you have to go through life, they can silence your, your, your voice, but never let them silence your spirit. That has got to continue to, to, be, to shout out loud. Ladies and gentlemen, the last question of the evening. I'm sorry for everyone else online. Yes, go. Um, hello. Hello. So I wanted to ask like, a question about microbiology, like something that you were... Yes. E there we go. Bacteria. So I'm in a lab, an honors lab bio class for freshman year. So we have a current event that we have to do every 15th of the month. So I found one that had to do with bacteria in your mouth could have something for your risk of cancer. And it mentioned microbiology in there and I wanted to know like how could it affect cellular division and something like that. Well, I don't think we know the answer to that in that specific case, but there are a lot of proposals for how bacteria would be influencing things like cell division or cancer or other, um, other events. And partly it's the things they produce. They produce chemicals, and those chemicals can then induce cells to do different things. And in other cases, it's because they allow some other organism into the human system that then induces something else. So there are a lot of different mechanisms, some of them not so direct, uh, but we, I think, are beginning to understand a little bit more about those. One that came out really recently was uh, really interesting that bacteria that get out of the gut, sometimes uh, because of uh, permeability in the wall, sometimes will incite an immune response that ends up killing a tumor. So that's the kind of thing nobody ever anticipated as being a mechanism for suppressing cancer. Also recently, didn't you success, not you necessarily, successfully um, create a poop transplant? Fecal yes. transplants, yes! I was hoping you would talk about the fecal transplant. Yeah. Yo, hit them with it! <laughs> you take poop out of one person and put it in another person, yeah. it makes them better? Yep. Yeah. That is nasty. I've done it. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Not literally. <laughs> so, so these microbiomes are doing way more than we ever imagined. Absolutely, and keeping us healthy is the biggest thing they do. So remember that next time someone calls them germs. We'll call them microbes. Yeah. Microbes, good microbes. And wasn't there a book called Microbes and Men? Yes. <laughs> but it was, I think, retitled Microbes and Women. Okay. <laughs> Microbes and Human Beings. There you go.
So let me, let me just go down the line here before we close this out. And just uh, one by one, if you could, what would be your recipe for making America smart again? Just, <laughs> Eugene. <laughs> yeah. uh, New Steelers fan! Hi, I don't know what he said. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, I guess voting. Voting. voting for science, and also I think things like the science march. I th I think I think being I think active people are up and, there and being. I, th I I'm optimistic. In the end, I think that you can forward good things, and over time, it it will work. Is sort of so. I think science marching. That's These immigrants are so hopeful. <laughs> I am very hopeful. I'm also sitting on a stage with you guys joking around. So yeah, I think yeah. it, I don't immigrants, they get the job done. I believe in the American dream. I adore it. Uh, Ophira. You know, I think we, we talk a lot about, um, like right now everyone's stressed out by what's going on and they're like, how am I going to deal with the climate? Self-care. I'll, I'll go to do some meditation and yoga. I think we have to stop focusing on ourselves. I think we have to focus on other people and, and our community and think outside of ourselves more often and think about um, how we are together rather than just laying down and going 10 minutes of headspace is going to make it all better. Mm, okay. John. I'm going to build on what Ophira has said and suggest, as I've done elsewhere, that everybody who is in science, in technology, or who cares about science and technology should tithe 10% of their time, whatever else they do, tithe 10% of their time to talking with other people, to engaging on how and why science and technology matter to our society, to our well-being, to the world what science is, how it works, what the sources of credibility in science are, and why we need to preserve and protect science. We need all of us to be better storytellers about this, to be activists, to be engaged in the policy process. Citizen action. Baba Tunde. Uh, thank you for having me here. It, no, I'm serious. It's been an incredible honor to be on stage with these civil servants, whether it's the comedic arts or the arts and sciences, and I'm, I'm humbled uh, to be a part of this. I want to echo what Eugene said. I happen to be at a meeting of the organizers of the Science March, and one of them cited a Niels Bohr quote, uh, quantum physics pioneer, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but he essentially described science as the steady reduction of prejudice. And if you think about what science actually is, you constantly challenge what you think to be true and replace it to what you know to be true. Wow. And if you're not constantly challenging, that's not science. Uh, so uh, we've been challenged up here. I encourage folks out there to do it. And I think what's coming up with the science march, whether it's you know, before, during, or after, is a testament to something much larger than the politics of the moment. It's about the larger pursuit of science, which is the reduction of all of our prejudices. <laughs> Um, I, I, just, I guess I just would encourage people to, as Eugene said, to be people of hope. But what I mean by that is I, I think this last 100 days has been some of the most hopeful period in my time as a senator. And, and it's not because the situation looks great, but you know, I, I spent eight years living in these high-rise projects in Newark. And the tenant president there who had her son murdered in, in the lobby of the building which I lived in, she was one of the most hopeful people that I met. And, and, I, and, and basically what she taught me was that hope doesn't exist in the abstract. It's always a response to despair. It's saying that despair will not have the last word. And, and that hope also is not a being word. You, you don't just sit in a state of being that's hope. Hope is an active, it's a fighter. It, 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 is, it is constantly working to create uh, that belief that, that, they, that you haven't surrendered. And so my, my, my hope is that I've seen the greatness of my country, whether it was the Women's March or how that health care bill, which was so awful, was beat back, not by politicians, but by a public, Republican and Democrat, who just said, there's no way we're going to tolerate that. And so right now, I, my prayer is that everybody remembers uh, those 10 two-letter words, that this country will, will, will succeed or fail based on those 10 two-letter words. And those 10 two-letter words is, if it is to be, it is up to me. I have got to be an agent of hope, and, and that's, that's sort of my, my parting word. Cool. Joe. One of the things I found really striking today was when we talked about things that excite the public about science, 
It was either because of fear or inspiration. And I think we need to find a way to explain science and teach science in, in logical ways, not, not fear-mongering, but that either incite fear or people's imaginations and inspiration. And it can't be just discovering new planets and discovering new cures. It has to go way beyond that to all of science. And I don't know how to do that, but I would challenge all of us to think about that. How do we inspire people about the fundamental quest for knowledge, which is the basis of science? Mm. Uh, if I uh, could offer some final reflections here. Um, you guys said almost everything I would have said. So you really left me with nothing. I got, I got nothing now. But let me share with you, uh, personally I try not to have hope because hope is the confession that you have no control of the outcome. And I don't ever want to cede that to a word. I want to say to myself, um, there's an outcome that I have some access to, some control over. And let me reiterate again why I don't I don't beat back politicians. There's something else deeper than that. And in our K through 12 system, what do we do? I think we view students as these vessels where you unzip their brain, their, their, their head, and pour information in for 12 years. And then you zip it back up, hand them the diploma, and send them off. And so we think that being educated is knowing stuff. When somewhere in there, one ought to be taught how to question knowledge, how to evaluate information and evidence. These are the foundations of science. We don't even have to call it science. Let's just call it curiosity. Because what is a scientist but a kid who never really grew up, right? It's, it's a kid who, who in adulthood retained childlike curiosity. And when you retain childlike curiosity, anything that happens before you is up for questioning. And you say, well, why are you doing it that way? Can it happen this way? Well, let me research that. And if you, in addition to being trained how to think about information, you're, if somehow we can retain your curiosity from childhood through adulthood, retain that curiosity, then you become lifelong learners, lifelong inquisitors, because we will spend many more years outside of school than in school. How many people do we know, if not among ourselves, the last day of school, you take your books, throw them into the air and say, school's done. As though that's the state you want to be in where you no longer have to learn. That's a failure of the educational system. You should come out of school and say, gee, I'm still curious. Can I go back in? Or is there some ways I can keep learning? And I think that if we breed an entire generation of people that are curious into adulthood, then you will never elect someone who just states things that are not true. That, can, that would never happen, okay? Because... If you build into the system curiosity, and where does the politics come? The politics layers on top of that, all right? So you don't say there is no global warming. We know there is. All right, so now that we know there is, let's have the, poli the political conversation. Are there carbon credits? Do, are, do you, do you uh, 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 f uh, subsidize? Or do you put up tariffs? That's where the politics needs to happen, not at any level below that. So my sense of this is, if you want to make America great, you first have to make it smart, and to make it smart, we have to retain the curiosity that we all had as children. And that way we can turn a sleepy country into an innovation nation. Amen. Red Bank, New Jersey, this has been Star Talk. And I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and my guests, Baba Tinde, the Senator, Joe, John, Elfira, okay. <laughs> Eugene, thank you all, New Jersey. As always, keep looking up.